Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the auditorium at Calvary Road Baptist Church in Monrovia, California. We are located at the southern end of the People's Republic of California, and we are on the east side of the Los Angeles County Gulag. And uh, we're glad that you're here. It is the 1st of July, and we had a beautiful day here in Southern California, not a cloud in the sky that I noticed. Of course, I spent most of my day inside and studying, and so I didn't get a chance except for brief, brief little forays outside to soak up a little bit of sun. Glad that you're here. I'd like to invite you to join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness and for the privilege of prayer. We come before you uh, with hearts that are full and rejoicing at the blessings of God. Uh, we recognize that we in and of ourselves do not deserve to approach you, but we have access because of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the shed blood of Christ. And we pray for certain individuals and for this church ministry. We would pray for Ozzy and Jillian, that you might bless their pregnancies, that their babies would continue to be healthy and, uh, and strong, and that both moms would go full term before delivery. We pray for Phyllis, uh, that you would help her in her struggle against uh, various debilitating issues from lupus to MS to a return of cancer. We pray for Veda and Hans and Archie and Shirley. We pray for Larry uh, with his MS. And uh, we pray for Marina and the excruciating pain that she is uh, so gallantly uh, seeking to address. We pray for uh, Donna and uh, pray that uh, the treatments for her esophageal cancer will be successful. We pray for Lee and his uh, infection in his leg. We pray for, for Stoney, uh, that you might bless him uh, as he fights uh, in the fight of his life. Uh, we pray also for our um, Through the Bible reading program. We pray for our discipleship ministry and that you might, we'd ask that you might bless our study of your word this evening. And, and for these things, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you, if you would please, I want you, if you would please, to make your way to John chapter 17. As you're making your way there, let me mention a couple of announcements to you. If you have a prayer request or would like to ask me a question about anything at all, feel free to send an email message to pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church. And unless you are a crank or a crackpot, your message will get to me and I will answer straightway. I do occasionally have cranks and crackpots try to reach out to me, but I, uh, I make no effort to them. I, 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 don't, I don't read uh, their emails. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't take the time nor the energy to try to delete them. It's not worth my effort. Uh, they're not even a blip on my on my uh, radar screen. Uh, plans are to have a Zoom session at 7 p.m. on Saturday, even though it is July the 4th. Uh, so join us on Zoom or listen on YouTube live stream nightly or, or, or weekly every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock. Um, and I completely understand if you have things to do on 4th of July. Uh, you may be someone, I, I was on a Monrovia Facebook page this week and someone uh, in very nice, very neighborly fashion uh, said that if you set off firecrackers, I hate you. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Um, used to be it was a wonderful thing in the United States of America to set off firecrackers on 4th of July and, and uh, celebrate uh, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And, uh, but it turns out, apparently, some people have um, I think, I, I think they call them house rodents, house rodents, and they get all quivery and shaky whenever they hear uh, a firecracker. But aren't these house rodents mostly shaky and quivery most of the time anyway? Isn't that all they do is quiver? 
I don't know. Um, and other people have dogs. And um, <laughs> people have all different kinds of pets, you know. Um, my brother had a dog when I was growing up. I had a big tomcat that used to fight dogs. Man, this cat was tough. I weighed this cat. I got him to, I got him to be still for just, a, just long enough. He weighed 20 pounds. That, my friends, is a big tomcat. And he was on an Indian reservation in Central Oregon, the Warm Springs Reservation. I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember where in the world we got this cat. But I did notice we lived in a quad area. And my dad, being the superintendent of the reservation, we lived at the head of the quad. And all these US Forest Service personnel, US Public Health Service people lived on either side. And the quad was about the size of a football field. And my cat, every day, would, would, would go the length of the quad with his tail sticking straight up in the air. And he was just sauntering along. And he would go down to Macy's grocery store. And then from Macy's, he would go down to the creek that, that ran from Mount Jefferson. And uh, I don't know what he was doing down there, but I noticed that as he, he walked down every day, he'd walk down, and, uh, and all, all these foresters had dogs. You know, and, you know, like one or two guys had a lab. Uh, one guy had a German shepherd. Uh, across the street, a guy had a Norwegian elk hound. And they had all these really bad boy dogs, you know. And I noticed that all these bad boy dogs would just snarl and run right up to the edge of their property line and then stop as they're barking and snarling at my cat. They never crossed the street and went onto the quad to where my cat was. Not one time did I ever see them attack my cat. You know why? My cat never ran. As soon as a cat runs from a dog, the cat is dead. Because the dog will grab it by the neck and do a little quick snap, breaks the cat's back, and the cat's dead. Um, so the only, the only solution for the cat, uh, and what my cat did, was he always rolled over on his back and would present four sets of claws. And if you were willing to give up your nose, if you were a dog who is willing to allow your nose made into hamburger meat, then you could have him. But I don't think he ever met a dog that was willing to make that sacrifice. So anyway, some people have um, house rodents. Uh, some people have dogs. Some people have cats. Um, uh, when my good friend, Pastor Johnston, was, was here, we had parakeets. Right, Sarah? We had parakeets. So that's about as domestic as I am. And, uh, but if you have something going on, Fourth of July, and, and you have other things going on other than uh, time to, uh, to tune in to our Zoom session, I completely understand. But let me just mention to you, if I could have your attention, um, what we're going to be doing this coming Saturday evening, um, we're going to, uh, we, we, several weeks ago, I, I dealt with the Bible being the Word of God, the sufficient scripture. And then um, two weeks ago, I discussed uh, author Diane West, Diana West's uh, parental loss of nerve assertions in her book. And then last Saturday, we dealt with the Old Testament examples of parental loss of nerve. The two primary examples, of course, being Eli with his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and then King David with his two sons, um, Absalom and Adonijah. Pathetic, pathetic. Uh, these guys were, uh, these <laughs> they're everything you could want, uh, you would think, in a leader, except they, uh, they, they couldn't deal with their children. Uh, this coming Saturday evening, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes dealing with the Frankfurt School and cultural Marxism and critical theory and Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Uh, you see, you could do all of those in 30 minutes. I could do all of those in five minutes. I'm just stretching it out. Um, then we'll deal with uh, social justice. Then we'll deal with, in weeks to come, we'll deal with intersectionality. Then we'll deal with uh, the whole issue of reconciliation. And um, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of a, a great Austrian school economist by the name of um, von Hayek. And um, <laughs> he, has, he, wrote a, he wrote a book in 1922 entitled Socialism and, and, and his ability to, to deal with issues 
with precision and intelligence were just absolutely astonishing. And then we're going to look at a, uh, a there's a, there's a, a guy uh, who grew up, at, was born and raised in South Central Los Angeles. He's a, he's a real big guy, was a football player, went to Texas to play football. His sophomore year in, in, in college, he came to know Christ. He quit football. He thought there's other, actually other things more important than playing football, such as the gospel. Uh, he ended up with a, uh, with a doctorate. His name was Vodi Bosham. And um, he uh, pastored and preached in the state of Texas for a number of years. He has now, for three and a half, coming up on four years, been the dean of a theological seminary in the African country of Zambia. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. We're gonna, we're, I'm going to expose you to him just a little bit, talk a little bit about his ministry, and then um, we're going to deal with other things. I, in, in a few weeks, unless I get recommendations or requests from people, uh, what I have out at the end of my uh, list of topics that I want to deal with is I, I want to expose you to a guy named Booker T. Washington. Guy was... Um, He's a hero. He, he, he needs to be recognized by every American as, as one of the stalwart figures for freedom and personal responsibility. Um, and a nation is blessed when, by the grace of God, someone like this gets raised up once every century. And he was the president of a place you may have heard of, in connection with World War II, although they had a they had a storied history before World War II ever came around, you've probably heard of the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, who flew those red-tailed fighter pilots uh, fighter planes in World War II. Uh, they were bomber escort pilots, uh, never lost a plane, uh, and they were a group a group of black uh, pilots, and. Um, uh, but Booker T. Washington was the guy who was for many years the president of Tuskegee Institute, and he was a, he was a man who molded men. Uh, he was a tremendous, tremendous personal leader. He, he was the he was the first black man ever invited to dine with the president of the United States in the White House, and all the Democrats got mad at Teddy Roosevelt for inviting him, and so uh, they're going to try to take Teddy's. Uh, face off of Mount Rushmore uh, because, because he's evil, wicked, mean, and nasty, they think, um, although he was, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not the greatest Teddy Roosevelt fan in the world, but uh, my goodness, he was, he was a world changer, this guy. So anyway, these are the things we're going to deal with on Saturday nights at 7 o'clock, and uh, you're welcome to join the Zoom session with us and participate Although generally on Saturday nights I have looky-loos who I can see their faces or whatever image they have up there, but they're not willing to talk. Uh, I don't snap at anybody. I don't bite anybody's head off. I don't criticize them, ridicule, or laugh at anybody who has signed in at Zoom. If you don't sign in, I might laugh at you. But if you do sign in, I make it a personal rule never to ridicule or laugh at somebody who's in the room with me because that's just my mama raised me different than that, okay? Uh, we also, final announcement before we uh, turn to uh, John chapter 17 and verse 4, we have a baby shower scheduled here in the auditorium for Saturday evening, July the 18th. That'll be at 7, 6 p.m., 6 p.m. I have written down here 7, but I, I remembered that I, uh, yeah, it's 6 p.m., and it's for uh, the baby that uh, Ozzy uh, Rodriguez is carrying. So Cy and Ozzy are going to be here. We like to do uh, male and female because we're, we're binary at Calvary Road Baptist Church, right? We're binary. Male and female created he them, right? We believe the Bible. And so we like to have uh, both uh, mommies and daddies at our baby showers. And uh, so we have a good time, and one of our guys, uh, different guys take turns running the baby shower. We have a good time. It's an enjoyable evening, and, uh, and you are more than cordially invited. So John chapter 17 and verse 4 reads, I have glorified thee on the earth. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking in his high priestly intercessory prayer. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Of course, he's speaking to God the Father. 
my text for this evening being this verse so that we can have a better understanding of the context in which our verse is found, I'd like for us to now read verses 1 through 5, you reading silently while I read aloud. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You'll notice at the end of verse 1, that the Lord Jesus Christ's initial statement of his prayer request for himself to the Father reads, Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. In verse 5, that's verse 1, in verse 5, the Lord Jesus Christ completes his petition to the Father by restating his initial request. So he's come kind of full circle and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Verse 2, you'll notice, records the basis for the Lord Jesus Christ's authority granted to him by God the Father. You'll see in the passage that the word is translated into the English word power, but it is the Greek word exousia, which refers typically and in our day to authority rather than might. It's talking about the authority to act. And so the Lord Jesus Christ rehearsed his authority to his father and in the presence of his apostles to establish the basis for granting eternal life to as many as the father had given to him. Now we recognize that the authorization granted to Christ and the gifting to Christ of the elect both took place in eternity past. Those are not two things that happened in time, okay? That these things happened before Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It is during the course of each of the elect's normal course of life, however, in conjunction with the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, the faith-generating preaching of the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and the drawing of God the Father, that's when the Lord Jesus Christ gives eternal life to the elect sinner as he repents of his sins and trusts Christ for salvation and for forgiveness. In verse 3, the Lord Jesus Christ clarifies what he meant by the phrase, life eternal. Notice it's not eternal life, it's life eternal because I think what he is dealing with here is more than just longevity. He's dealing with far more than, than uh, duration. Why? Because every human being once brought into existence by God ha ha has an existence of infinite duration. If you've ever taken geometry uh, I hate to do this, you know, because some people, as soon as you say anything related to math, their eyes just kind of get glossy. Uh, and if you, if you go another step, then their eyes roll in the back of their head. And then eventually, no, never mind. Uh, but a line stretches from infinity in this direction to infinity in this direction, Okay. That would be a geometric um, um, representation of the duration of God's existence. He has no beginning. He has no end. He has always been. If you're going to, if you're going to geometrically describe the existence of an angel or a human being, you would use what is called in mathematics particular geometry, a ray, R-A-Y. That's not a guy, that's a term. And it refers to 
it has a, a, a point of origination and it goes off in a straight line for all eternity. It never ends, okay? By the way, that's, the, that's, that's life for a human being and sometime later in that person's life, if they come to Christ, then that, there's another ray which describes their eternal life. It starts at a point and it continues for eternity. Somebody says, well, can you lose your salvation? Uh, actually, no, it's not a ray if you, now the Bible doesn't say it's a ray, but that's the mathematical representation. And so what we have here is, is we, have, we have the Lord Jesus Christ referring not to the duration of someone's existence. We're talking about um, a, a, a quality of life that is referred to here as life eternal. And um, we, we, we clearly understand, we certainly realize that the Lord Jesus Christ was not in his prayer trying to clarify the phrase life eternal for the benefit of his heavenly father. He doesn't need to clarify his terms with God the Father, who is, after all, omniscient, right? Rather, the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, he's praying to the Father, but he's praying to the Father with 11 companions nearby, and he clarified the meaning of the phrase life eternal for the benefit of those 11 companions and also subsequent readers of John's gospel down through the centuries. So it is for our benefit that he is letting us know and communicating to us what life eternal is. Life eternal is not knowing about God. Life eternal is not knowing about Jesus Christ. I know about Ronald Reagan, but I never met him. Right? I know about Harry Truman, but I never met him. I know about Jimmy Carter, but I never met them. Life eternal isn't knowing about God or about Jesus Christ. Life eternal is knowing God, the Father, and knowing Jesus Christ, who was sent by God. Now understand, when a baby is born, and recently we have... Uh, we have mommy and daddy, and we have little Hannah with us this evening. And uh, little Hannah, from the moment she was born, was as much her daddy's daughter as she will ever be. She will never be more her dad's daughter than she was the moment she was born, all right? But when she was born, she knew almost nothing about her father, okay? Other than he was loud, he was ugly, and he smelled bad, all right? But other than that, she knew nothing about him. Mom, on the other hand, was quiet and soft and smelled so good. Mama took care, daddy scared, that kind of thing. But anyway, she is her father's daughter. And what will happen in her life as she proceeds in this life and the relationship she has to her father she will come to know more about him as time goes on. And, and, and that, that's, that is an appropriate description of what it's like between the Christian and God and the Christian and the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to know much about God or about Jesus Christ to become a Christian, but you have to have been introduced to him. You have to know him, okay? And once you come to know him, you have life eternal. And then over time, how much you know about God the Father and how much you know about the Lord Jesus Christ will grow and intensify over time. So this is accomplished when the sinner responds to the gospel of God's grace and comes to faith in Jesus Christ is justified by faith Romans chapter 5 verse 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ you are then born again by the Spirit of God and and you become God's own you're a member of the family of God the moment that you trust Christ as your Savior so this is the background of verse 1 verse 2 verse 3 we now come to verse 4 
And let's read that again together. I have glorified thee on the earth, the Savior said. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. <clears throat> there are two phrases in verse 4 that are declarations of fact in which the Lord Jesus Christ states forthrightly what he has done. The first statement causes no initial difficulty with most who read it. The second statement is a bit perplexing um, and requires careful consideration. Not that the first statement doesn't require consideration, but it doesn't usually red flag people as often as the second sentence. Notice this first statement, I have glorified thee on the earth. Please pay careful attention to the way the Lord Jesus Christ crafted this statement, okay? Uh, words are important. His words were carefully chosen. I'm one of those people who believes in the verbal plenary inspiration of God. I believe that the, the words of the Bible were chosen by the Holy Spirit when he used human authors to pen portions of scripture, okay? I believe the words were chosen. I believe it is fully inspired. I don't believe that all portions of the Bible are, are, are equally important, but I do believe that all portions of the Bible are equally inspired, okay? So that means we need to be careful to the actual wording. We have more here in the Bible than just a general flow of thoughts and ideas. We have, we have particular and precise wording that is provided for us, and we need to be careful. And by the way, we need to be careful ourselves. I, I have a statement that I say with some people to their chagrin from time to time, uh, please excuse me for actually meaning what I actually say. I try to carefully select and arrange the words that I speak. Why? Because I think words are important. Amen? I'm not interested in directional accuracy. I want there to be precision of words, all right? And so Hannah is objecting to me talking about her during church. And so, uh, but that's okay. I'm, so, I'm just glad that she's here, all right? So notice, notice that the Lord Jesus Christ was very particular in claiming that he glorified God, quote, on the earth. This specificity should provoke thoughtful consideration and some reflection on this whole issue of glorifying God. We know from Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, Thou wert worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Uh, this, is, this is my life verse. I, I love this and what it says, but we see here that from this verse that the whole purpose of God's creation, his creation of the time-space-matter continuum is to show forth his glory. That's the reason he did it. That's the reason you and I exist. Further, we know that throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity past, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune Godhead, he certainly glorified God his Father before the creation of the time-space-matter continuum. Before this, this universe existed, don't, don't, don't think the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't busy glorifying his Father because he was. He was. But our consideration is how God has been glorified since the dawn of creation, since the beginning of the time-space-matter continuum. We know that God has been glorified in creation. Jesse, Jesse, yo-yo, sit down. Thank you. We know, we know that God has been glorified in creation, uh, Psalm 19, verse 1, because we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. 
we see that God is glorified by his providences in Exodus chapter 15, verses 6 and 7. When God does things that are not apparent, when God does things that are not miraculous, they're not showstoppers, they're not eye poppers, but he's still doing stuff. And in such a way, he is by those things glorified. But the Lord Jesus Christ refers in our text to something far beyond those revelations of God's glory. Christ has glorified God the Father in his person. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. He glorified him by his miracles. Matthew chapter 9 verse 8. He glorified him by his words continually giving all praise to him. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25 as well. He glorified the Father by his holy life. Therefore, when he said, I have glorified thee on earth, he referred not to his glorification of the Father in eternity past before time began, or the glorification of the Father in the natural order and by means of the non-miraculous. No, he refers by this statement to his direct and personal activity of supernaturally glorifying God the Father since the time of his incarnation, since the time of his virgin conception, his sinless life, and by his representation of God the Father among men, by all that he said and by all that he did. That's what he's talking about when he talks about glorifying the Father on the earth. What comes to mind as we consider this statement is that his earthly work has not yet been completed when he uttered this statement. Though he will give up the ghost on the cross of Calvary in less than 24 hours, in some measure the manner in which he speaks anticipates the completion of his earthly ministry. And you might wonder, how is this possible? Keep in mind that the Lord Jesus Christ is not a time-bound creature. He is not bound by the limits of time on one hand, and on the other hand, he is no creature. He was not created. Amen? He did the creating. He speaks, therefore, from the perspective of eternity, making this statement both comprehensible and utterly true. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. We approach this second statement in the verse being mindful of our understanding of the Savior's perspective when he made the first statement. He is not time bound. He is no creature. Therefore, though he has the greatest work to accomplish within the next 24 hours, he has the prerogative. It's his right it's not even a privilege, it's his right to refer to it as a finished work that God had given to him to accomplish. Why? Because time is something that he uses. And although he existed in time, he also exists outside of time. And so he makes use of time. It's a tool. And he has the privilege, he has the prerogative, he has the absolute divine right and sovereignty to refer to it and to make use of it in any way he chooses. Accomplish the work he would, accomplish the work he did, because with the God-man, all is the same. All is the same. He went to the cross of Calvary. He hung between heaven and earth. He took upon himself the sins for which he would die. He suffered the full weight, wrath, and fury of God's punishment, endured an estrangement from the first person of the triune Godhead for the first time in history and welcomed physical death. Hebrews informs us that without the shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Yet the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood for the remission of sins. He endured the death of the cross, did he not? Three days and nights later, he rose from the grave, ascended as our great high priest to the throne room in heaven, 
and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. By the way, you might want to turn to Revelation chapter 19 sometime. I mean, not right now, when you get home. But one of the things that you'll notice when you read chapter 19 as John the Revelator looks and sees heaven open and the one comes out of heaven riding a white horse whose name is Faithful and True and he will be clothed in a vesture dipped in blood and his name will be called the Word of God and he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords whose blood Whose blood? Don't answer. Rhetorical question. But keep in mind, it cannot possibly be the blood of his enemies. He has no enemies in heaven. All right? And he didn't have blood on him when he ascended to heaven. Right? But as our great high priest, he must make an offering for the remission of sins, and it must be a blood offering. If Old Testament typology is, is to follow, the high priest Aaron was obligated to take the, the blood of the, uh, of the Passover lamb, and he was to take that in a vial, and he was to take it into the Holy of Holies, and he was to sprinkle it on the what? Sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Okay? Remember, in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a five-sided box. The top of the Ark of the Covenant, and it was made out of acacia wood, okay? But the top of the Ark of the Covenant was made out of solid gold, and it had beaten into the gold two cherubim whose... whose uh, uh, wings arched over, almost touching. And beneath was the, was the, was the mercy seat. And, and the high priest, in the darkness, the pitch darkness of the Holy of Holies, there was no light in there, okay? There was the glory of God, but he probably covered that with, with smoke from incense. He was, to take, he was to take the blood that was shed, and he was to sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Well, that's just a type of reality, okay? You realize, you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to by the Apostle Paul in his letter to Romans as the hilasterion? That is to say, he is the mercy seat. So is it not interesting, the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, the sacrifice which would be hung on Calvary's cross to die for our sins, but he is also our great high priest. And what is the function of the high priest but to offer the sacrifice? And what is the sacrifice that he offers but the shed blood of the perfect sacrifice? Well, who was the perfect sacrifice? He was. So whose blood must the high priest offer? His own blood. And where would the high priest offer that blood? On the mercy seat. But who does the Apostle Paul tell us is the mercy seat? The Lord Jesus Christ. Thereby we have explained to us why the Lord Jesus Christ at the time of his second coming is going to be wearing a garment that is saturated in blood. Whose blood? The blood of his enemies? Oh no, he hasn't yet gotten here. He hasn't yet begun to kill people. He hasn't yet begun to judge the Christ-rejecting world. He's coming to us as not only the Lamb of God and the Lion of the tribe of Judah and our great high priest and our King and Lord. He's also coming back to us as the one who was the mercy seat. And so for the remission of our sins, he applied his blood to himself. You say, well, what does that mean, Pastor? It means that Jesus Christ is everything. He's everything. He's everything. Don't we sing a song here sometimes? Jesus is all the world to me. I, actually, he's more than that. He's, he's our everything. So, gone, 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 gone. My sins are gone. 
All my sins are gone. They are washed clean away. And that is the basis for God saying, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. On what basis does God not remember my sins? My sins have been washed clean by the blood of Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. That, my friends, is really good. Amen? That's shouting ground. Amen? I won't frighten anybody at home, but that is shouting ground. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for your goodness. We appreciate so much the opportunity we have to study your word. We recognize that certain doctrines are declared and certain doctrines are derived. And I've spoken a bit about some derived doctrines that not, every, not everyone might agree with me. That's okay. Uh, not worth fussing over. What's worth fussing over are the declared doctrines of the Bible. That Jesus is the Son of God. He is God the Son. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is raised from the dead. He is seated at your right hand in glory. These things are declared in the word of God, and they are truths not only worth living for, they are truths worth dying for. Bless our study of your word. Give to us courage in our convictions, and we will for that thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.